Hi everyone, welcome. I am Jessica Poholsky. I'm the creator of Once Upon a Pesto and today joining me is Ksenia. She is in Canada currently and we're gonna be talking about immigrant cuisine or immigrant food and recipes. She has lived in the former USSR as well as Israel and like I said, she's now living in Canada. And her handle is Immigrants Table and she also has a wonderful, fantastic, delicious blog, uh, immigrantstable.com. And I encourage you in this conversation to comment, ask questions, tag both her and us and her handle again is Immigrants Table. That way she can get back to you and answer all your questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and invite her on up and then we will get going. Everyone's having a great day and looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be great. Uh, Sunny is going to join us very shortly, and there she is. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you? Excellent. Super happy to be with you today. You as well. I'm so happy to have this conversation, Senia. Um, I know you have so much information, so many experiences, so much delicious, delicious knowledge to share. Um, so let's get dive right in. Um, first, tell us, tell us about your journey um, ac across the globe, essentially, right? Uh, where you lived and how you ended up where you are today. Sure. So, yeah, so I was born in the former Soviet Union, Russia today, but at the time, former Soviet Union, and um, grew up in like a typical Soviet household, eating whatever is available in <laughs> Um, but when I was six years old, after the collapse of the Union, uh, we actually went to Israel. And I discovered this whole world of Jewish cooking. And turns out my family has been cooking Jewish for generations without knowing that, uh, that it, you know, like what, what Jewish actually means you put into practice in, uh, in Soviet Union. So, yeah. And then I grew up on Middle Eastern food, on flay, on this world of flavors, lemon, parsley, garlic, all these things that are so lacking in Slavic cooking. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so that was, that was the bulk of my kind of, my palate. Um, and then when I was 19, I moved to Canada for university. And that's when I started cooking. I discovered that I really needed a way to kind of relive my roots, you know, reconnect with my family and, and feel a part of that immigrant's table again. And so I started cooking. I started digging in my grandmother's archives uh, for, for recipes and, you know, asking relative I could for like their, their secrets and tips. <laughs> really just try to first create like my family's recipes and then create my own. So today it's it's really a melange. It's it's the Russian roots, it's uh -huh. Middle Eastern influences, but also living in North America, you really become aware of what's available in season here. And yeah, and then collecting things from all over the world, from travel, from other immigrant friends I get to cook with. So it's it's really it's a melange. Wow. Fascinating that, that <laughs> journey that you take and, you know, kind of eating along the way, like you said, certain ingredients are completely foreign in, in many senses to one country to the next. So um, I'd love to talk, you know, first about, you know, those Russian influences. What is Russian cuisine like? If, if you had to kind of highlight certain ingredients, certain dishes, um, what is that experience of food like in Russia? So everybody always thinks about, whenever people think about Slavic kitchen, they think a lot about root vegetables. Okay. Um, so that's for sure a big part of it. Things that last a long time. So carrots, potatoes, beets, th onions, like things that you can keep in your larder for a long time without having to worry about them going bad. Um, and then really like, like economical staples, like cabbage, that sort of thing. Then there's there's a lot of meat, which I personally like don't cook so much, but that's, okay. that's definitely a part of Slavic cuisine. Meat, um, cheeses, more fresh cheeses, not so much aged cheeses. So ricotta like uh, and a lot of fermentation, which is something mm. that people don't necessarily think of, but there's a lot of lacto fermentation, a lot of brining. 
basically ways to try and work with long winters, short hard seasons, like, like hot, rainy summers that pro provide a big harvest, mm -hmm. and then having to make that last through, again, a long winter. So yeah, a lot of like root vegetables, things that last a long time and preserving through fermentation, through um, like of, of all sorts, brining, pickling or uh, lacto-fermentation. And of course, we can't forget the, the baking. There's a lot uh -huh. of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeast, like a lot of like yeast heavy things um, and mayonnaise, unfortunately, eggs. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the bad, you know, this is what everybody pictures, like these mayonnaise heavy salads, but it's not, it's not the essence of Russian cuisine. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of what ended up getting created, especially during Soviet times, because that's, that was the main kind of thing that was available to make things last and hide tastes. Okay. But in original Russian cuisine, like in old Russian cuisine, it's actually, it's a lot of fermentation more fresh flavors, a little bit of garlic, salt, pepper, not so much on other spices. Okay. But start getting into other, um, other countries like Kazakhstan, like Ukraine, even Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, you see a lot more influences from the Silk Road and the spice, like, like spices. So. Wow. It's incredible. Like just that information. Um, I'm curious too, as you've traveled and, and, and also lived here in North America for some time now, have you seen outside of your own cooking those Russian influences in d different areas? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it was very interesting. I remember the first time we went to the Czech Republic and, you know, the history of, of, the, of Russia or former Soviet empire and the Czech Republic is not a positive one. Mm -hmm. But it's incredible when you eat, when you, when you go to restaurants and when you eat local Czech food and you see so many of those commonalities, uh, so many of the common like kind of root ingredients and uh, techniques that, that define Slavic cuisine. And I had the same experience in Poland. Okay. Uh, like I, some dishes are absolutely identical. Others are different with a local twist. Then you know, as you go for to, further uh, towards Yugoslavia, like you're seeing again, some of those repetitive flavors, um, but Yugoslavia has a lot more Turkish influences. So it's, okay. it's different. And then um, what else? And then of course, like lower Germany, you're seeing a lot of very, very common, common uh, cuisine to Slavic. Mm -hmm. cuisine. Yeah. Very neat. Um, I, I love the mention of Poland too, because it, it just, I literally, I'm not kidding. I had pierogies for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a great idea. Maybe that's what I'll make for dinner. Ah, do you make great the dough idea. and everything from scratch? Yeah, I do. Wow. I do. Not on a regular basis. Usually uh -huh. this will be like a full day production. So we'll make a bunch and then freeze them. And then we use them as, as you know, as the need arises. So oh. we don't out as like precious little dumplings. Wonderful. <laughs> what you have choice? What did you eat for lunch? It was a uh, potato with, you know, the, the sauteed onions or fried onions, whichever you want to call it, but. Delicious, delicious. Yes. <laughs> Good caramelized onion with potatoes. I, I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it's I love just it. a natural sweetness, right? You don't need any extra flavors to cover it up. It just speaks for itself. And do you eat it with sour cream or how do you eat it? It was served with sour cream, but I did not take the sour cream. <laughs> the it, people, so in Russia, the traditional way is either sour cream or mayo. You can do okay. either or, but then on the side, a really strong spicy mustard. Oh. And that's the flavor. Like that's where a lot of that hit comes from. So people tend not to know that, but yeah, you in the Russian way, pair it with a strong mustard. I love it. I love mustard and it just sounds amazing. I'm definitely writing that down to try next time. <laughs> yeah, it's such an easy thing to do. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's hop over then to Israel and, and talk about that cuisine. And, and you know, you mentioned the, the flavors like garlic and, and so on. So what was that change like for you? 
Oh, it's it's a huge change, and especially having made that as as, as a child, right? Like it was a whole different world, and Israel is a melting pot, right? Like like it's it's such a. This is why I tend to talk about Middle Eastern cuisine more than Israeli cuisine because there's little cuisine that is really. I mean, there are some things, but most of it comes from other influences from immigrants who come there and brought their kitchen with them. And of course, the regional variety, like what you're seeing in Lebanon, what you're seeing in Jordan, what you're seeing in Syria, it's, it's, that's, that's the big building blocks of, Isra of Israeli cuisine. Uh -huh. So yeah, so you're, you have all these amazing local flavors, like really good olive oil, good mm. garlic, yeah, like good lemon, very heavy on lemon, not so much vinegar. So, um, and then you add to that just natural spices. So again, kind of the Silk Road influences. You have cumin, you have coriander, you have za'atar, which is um, which is oregano mixed with thyme, and usually in the in Israel and Palestine also sesame seeds. Um, yeah, so those okay. sumac, those are kind of like the the, the nice the nice spices that we, we see. Very tasty, I think. Um, and, and a dish, you know, it, it is that, that Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, you're seeing like lots of grains and seafood, correct? Vegetables. Um. Less seafood in Israel because it, it's, 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 as a Jewish country, there's not, uh, we, they don't eat shellfish or things like that. Mm -hmm. But definitely um, there's a lot of, it's either it tends to be either vegetables okay. so a lot of vegetarian cuisine like very vegetable forward market produce whatever is in season in big quantities um a lot of dairy dairy is huge in uh in israel huge part of the of the diet the industry it's really really like it's called the land of milk and honey <laughs> and then uh, meats that are more like lamb, uh, more chicken, but also like different kinds of chicken. I that may I don't, I don't know what they're called in English, but like smaller chickens, like not Cornish hen, but sort of okay. like like a lot of lamb, like those those flavors. Uh, of course, you have beef, but mm -hmm. not as much, not as much as in Canada, as in places in the Midwest. Okay. More, more lamb, chicken, fish, and then vegetarian. And, and talk to me about then desserts. You know, what is that scene like in, in Middle Eastern? If you have uh, that. <laughs> uh, there's, there's such a world like, so I, I'm always drawn to the, the sesame, like the halva, the sesame seed type desserts with silan and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you're putting that aside, there's a lot of yeasted, again, a lot of yeasted dough that influence comes from Europe. So uh, babka, everybody knows, yes. um, browns, that, that's, that's a lot, like a lot of yeasted chocolate cakes, um, rugelach, so that's like the little brother of the croissant. So again, it's a yeasted dough that's rolled, um, not, not unlike a, a, a croissant that's more about layering and building the, those layers of fat and uh, fat and dough. Um, is about yeast, like right, letting the dough ferment and rise, and then you actually roll it with chocolate. Um, yeah, cheesecakes, huge mm. part, cheesecakes, and then a lot of desserts that are actually focused on the fruit. Okay. Combination with nuts and, uh, and cheese. Awesome. And, and when you take these recipes and, and, you know, your day to day, how often are you incorporating what, what you grew up with? So I'd say Middle Eastern, we incorporate almost on a daily basis. A lot of what I cook for, for my family, like not just for the blog, but actually for, for us to eat tends to be Middle Eastern flavors. So whether it's shakshuka for breakfast, like eggs scrambled in a, in a tomato, or in my case, eggplant and tomato sauce, 
mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's a, it's a cheese platter for dinner with labane and all the market veggies and zatal and trina and hummus for dipping. Uh, or for lunch, we're often eating like stewed vegetables, so like tomatoes, eggplant, courgette, like, uh, zucchini, like a lot of stewed kind of Middle Eastern dishes. And then winter, you're getting soups and couscous and kind of those kind of uh, those kind of heavier chameen, a lot of chunt. So yeah, we eat a lot of Middle Eastern on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Will tend to be either if my if we're meeting with family, um, it's rare that like I wouldn't necessarily make a Russian dish on a regular like, but for special occasions for family, yeah, we do, we do. And then okay. now, once I hear the word pierogi, the you know you, you know that's <laughs> and then you're sold. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and how is it then, you know, certain ingredients that are so unique to those countries, um, how do you go about finding them? Say, you know, people watching this, they want to they wanna make some of these recipes that are specific to these cultures, but it's not as common an ingredient. Are there substitutions or how do you go about finding those unique things? Yeah, so in a lot of, in a lot of recipes, I'll either provide a substitution or a way to make that ingredient. Okay. So, like, I often talk about how to make cheese curds or how to make uh, labane, which is a base for a lot of the, the, the dipping sauces or things that we eat. Mm. Um, but honestly, like, these days, especially with seasonings, so much is available. Spices, you can really buy a lot on Amazon, online, through your local spice store. So it, on that, we've gotten much, much better. And the rest of it is usually tends to be easy to find. So parsley, coriander, garlic, lemon, you know, those flavors are not, not hard to locate. So we either provide substitutions or ways to kind of make it yourself. Sorry. Or um, I often provide links or something like that. Okay. Reason. Great. Um, so it, it's, it's manageable, right? Like this idea of, you know, cooking foreign things, uh, which then leads me to my, my biggest question, Senya, is, is how did this idea of immigrants table come about? You know, when was that moment where you realized this was your passion, you want to create it, something to share to other people? Uh, when did that, how did that happen? <laughs> So I well, it started eight, so about eight years ago, the, the blog started in November. So funny, okay. we're reaching a, probably a, an anniversary of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really like, I was working a job where I was writing for a living on a daily basis, but it wasn't inspiring me. And all my free time was being spent in the kitchen. We were, I was hosting, I was cooking for friends. And I was like, why don't I try and combine like mm. I'm creative writing I don't get that outlet job and I'm cooking so what if I try to use creative writing to transmit those stories to the foods uh -huh. that's really what kind of started it it was an attempt to replicate um, immigrant journeys through the foods that we eat and uh, provide like kind of a map how my family first of all immigrated and collected things along the way and then also working with other immigrants and, and kind of tracing their paths that led them to their, to their tables. Um, yeah, so it started and over the years, of course, it adapted and, you know, became more, le less, less just about long form creative writing and more about providing easy, re accessible recipes that home cooks can actually replicate so it's it's definitely changed, but that was what started it. Wanting to to talk about how food brings us together and what yeah. we're on the way, you know. Oh, it's so neat, so inspiring too, because everyone, like you said, you talk to different immigrants, and everyone has their own story. And sometimes we don't tap into that. So how is it? You know, how do you how do you, how do you go about discovering these kinds of things? And not everyone keeps their recipes and these family traditions, um, what, what it, like, just kind of explain that whole idea of immigration and how it relates to food and tradition. Well, I mean, I, it's absolutely true that a lot of people don't write things down and don't, I mean, I, I deal with this with my grandmother all the time. She's like, 
make a dough. And I'm like, what does that mean? You just make a dough. Like, <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm 35. I, a 20 year old doesn't even know how to make, like, you know what I mean? There's that, yeah. there's that gap that they all have. And then over the generations, it dissipates. So you got to, you got to prod them. Like I'm an inquisitive person by nature. So that's why I don't have a problem doing this. <laughs> and I'm trying to do this for, for others, but just like ask questions, ask wow. why this, why that, why this combination? How did this change? What, what does a dough mean to you? Why this dough and not that dough? So I just, I try to ask questions of my own family, of others, of how, you know, when I met my husband, like he's, He's Colombian, but he's an engineer. So for him, cooking is about subsistence. <laughs> like, you know, there's no cooking for fun or to explore your family traditions. But when we got together, I was like, okay, well, teach me about Colombian cooking. Show me what recipes speak to you. What do you remember? Mm -hmm. And as he like slowly started sharing some of these things with me, we started like, I started learning more about him. So it was a beautiful way to like learn more about each other and yeah. from somebody who doesn't spend time thinking about that. So mm -hmm. I'd say the best thing to do is just kind of ask, you know, like ask, ask people, ask about what, what do they remember from their mother's house, from their grandmother's house? Mm -hmm. What are the dishes that, that come to mind? What does this smell remind them? That's, that's what I like to do. Yeah, it's, it's a full sensory experience, the taste, the smell, um, feel, you know, thinking of dough, kneading that dough, there's nothing like it. Um, and and you, you talked about what do your mother make? What did your grandmother make? When you were growing up, were there certain recipes that you always dreamt of, you know, making yourself, you know, from a kid to an adult or like or favorite dishes you always looked forward to? For sure. You know, my grandmother's like cheese, uh, well, they're called vatrushki, but like cheese buns. They're, they're it's hard to explain. It's like a yeast of dough. Everything's a yeast of dough. <laughs> <laughs> With like sweet um, homemade, like kind of cottage cheese filling. So okay. that was one recipe that I was like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> Napoleon, which is like a millefeuille, like sort of like a millefeuille, but a Russian version. That oh. I was, this is the best cake, like <laughs> that. Um, and as I moved to to Israel, I I found eggplant dishes super fascinating. Mm. Anything with eggplant, I was like, tell me, teach me. Um, a lot of stuffed vegetables in Middle Eastern cuisine. I I really like learning about that. How you stuff different vegetables. I just did a recipe on stuffed onions, which you know not so many people think about stuffing onions, but it's no. actually yeah, there's, there's all sorts of all sorts of secrets to learn if you just ask. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and thinking of this idea of family, the table coming together around it. Um, feel free to mention your great news. Um, but you know, what is what is that experience like for you as a family? You know, knowing your your husband's Colombian, you have a, a unique history, background, heritage. Um, what does the table mean to your family specifically? And, and you know, kind of how do you hope to educate others about that experience through what you do on your blog? So that's, that's a great question. So I, I the news that you're, you're talking about <laughs> a little bump uh, that doesn't come from just eating too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're expecting our second, uh, hopefully second last, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have, we have a, a two-year-old and definitely bringing him into the mix really changed it I, you know what i wouldn't say it necessarily changed the way i see food but okay. it deepened the importance of kind of what what i believe food does mm. which is translate stories translates experience connects us to culture so we really try and use like family dinner time, lunch time as, as an opportunity to, we can't tell stories yet because he doesn't necessarily understand, but we hope that through those tastes that he's going to take with him into the future, he's going to have these memories and he's going to be connected to his roots, whether it's Colombian 
whether it's Russian, whether it's Jewish, Middle Eastern, or just Canadian, because at the end of the day, he's Canadian. Sure. Right? And then this one will be as well. So uh -huh. it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting thing to raise children that are multicultural and like multilingual. But, you know, I, I hope that they'll take that passion with them into the future and then pass that on to their children. Yeah, yeah. What's what's going to be the first dish you teach your son to make? It's probably, it's just going to depend on what he's, uh, what he's in the mood for. Um, <laughs> like, like, he helps in little ways, but uh -huh. I like some kind of cookies or something like that. I don't know if it's going to be very... Well, these days he ma he helps me. What was he doing the other day? I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, I was making uh, muffins and he was mm -hmm. boiling the the muffin tins like, <laughs> dough, like like these things with supervision, of course, because mm -hmm. otherwise the the muffins end up on the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> on his face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. Sunny, so, mean, this is such a wonderful conversation. I, I adore what you do, this idea of storytelling and food and culture. It's just, it's so fascinating and there's no end to it. Um, yeah. You know, everyone has their story. There's hundreds of countries around the world. So for, for people watching and for people who are going to watch this later, um, I encourage them to comment, to ask questions and tag you at Immigrants Table. Um, but for, you know, for us who are curious to learn more and go out and find this on our own, where can we find what you do and follow along? So thank you. So it's immigrantstable.com online. It has all the recipes. Um, if you go to my Instagram profile and you click the, the, the link there, it'll take you directly to the website. You can check out some of the featured recipes or you can explore. Uh, we try to update seasonally as, mm -hmm. as festivals occur. There's really, there's a lot of, I, there's new recipes posted weekly recipes constantly being updated so the bulk of the work is definitely being done on the website and then Instagram, we just share kind of things things uh as they come along but the recipes are all on the website and then there's videos on youtube and it's all immigrants table so immigrantstable.com on the web or immigrants table on other social platforms easy and delicious <laughs> and of course like anybody is welcome to subscribe to the newsletter because that's kind of the best way to get like updates of when things things change and what are the compilations that we're working on. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. It has been a wonderful conversation. Um, best wishes to you and your family with the um, up and coming new member. Yeah. And yeah. I, I hope everyone watching has enjoyed this conversation as well. And like I said, feel free to comment, ask questions and, and follow along with what Senia does immigrantstable.com. Thank you so much, Jessica. It was such a fun time to talk. You're so welcome. Have a good evening. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye.